Hi, yes, it's the Allison Arngram Show, and I'm Allison Arngram. Although some of you may remember me as the evil Nellie Olson, <laughs> tonight I am Allison Arngram, and this is the Allison Arngram Show. And here on the Allison Arngram Show, we talk about things that make us feel good. The TV shows and the movies that made us feel good, and the people who made them, and the people who are doing things now to make the world a better and more interesting place. And I've got one tonight. You know, I get excited when I get to interview somebody I know. So I'm like, ah! and then not only, and I'm not only interviewing someone I know, I'm interviewing someone who I haven't seen in several years. And it's like, ah, ah, things working, pandemic, everything. Like, oh my God, ah, where have you been? So I'm, I'm horrifyingly excited. Um, so this person is coming on she's a she's a director and and now she's written a book so now she's an author as well director acting teacher and i met her and we have hysterical stories about how we met it's really funny um but she is amazing and i just have to tell you on on her website of of where she has her classes she has quotes of people uh jane lynch for instance saying sue hamilton is truly the actress director encouraging all of us to perform at the top of our game creating a fun and imaginative environment in which to work these kind of things. And there's a quote here that says, she took everything I had, picked it up, swung it around by its tail over her head and threw it back up on the stage. Every instinct she had was dead on. It reached the point that I think if she told me to put my head in a bucket and jump off of the stage, I'd have done it. And that quote is from me, Alice and <laughs> <Arngram. laughs> <laughs> so, the person who I felt I could trust enough as a director to put my head in a bucket, ladies and gentlemen, Sue Hamilton. Oh, thank you, Allison. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh my God. Not. How the heck are you? Oh, I'm very well, and it's so nice to see you after all this time. Thanks for having me on. Oh, this is so much fun. So, yeah, now, how did you start to write? Because I met you in, was it 2004? Somewhere I think so. Yes. Back in ye olden days is when we ye met. Olden yes. days. And you've yes. already been working for quite some time. What's that? You'd been working for quite some time by then. How did yes, you start? I had. Well, you know, I started as an actor and I believe it was about 1995 that I had this idea to bring a bunch of friends together and just start reading plays and start writing plays. And the first play that we happened upon was Eve Ensler's Floating Rhoda and the Glue Man. And this was before she had written the vagina monologues. Anyway, the, the story is I got very passionate about her work. I wrote to her agent. I said, you know, this is who we are. We're, you know, young actors in Los Angeles. We'd really love to do Eve's work. And he said, oh, that's great. You know, how many shows have you directed? And I said, oh, none. <laughs> no, no shows, no shows. Um, but he trusted us and Eve trusted us. And that was the very first play I directed. And literally, Allison, from that point, it was like stepping into what I was absolutely supposed to be doing. From there, it just took off. And one of the things you push, because her book is called Have Fun or Quit, um, is that, you know, sometimes you, you have to take the leap. You have to take risks. You have to do things you, you, you think might not work. It's just audition to audition. Just do it. So this is how we met. So <laughs> it wasn't like, oh, I tracked her down. We had a meeting about how I could do something with my show, Confessions of a Prairie Bitch. And, or I said, I yes, I must put video to that. I should meet with this director and go do it down at the Gay and Lesbian Center at the Renford. No, I went to be interviewed on a talk show, as I do constantly. And is, this was a teeny, 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 tiny little cable talk show. I think it aired in North Carolina. I'm not sure. This was like before everything was on the internet. And I went to the studio and there was nobody there. And I started to wonder if I'd really like gone to the wrong place or maybe this was a bad idea. They had no staff. They just had <laughs> so the woman was in a room with a set and a camera and there was literally no one there. She had like no one helping her bringing people in. So I'm wandering the halls of this empty building. And finally, I see a person. I see this woman walking to my God, thank God, somebody works, somebody here that I can talk to. <laughs> and so I say, hi, hi, thinking they must be looking for me, but I'm Allison Arngram. And this woman looks me up and down and says, yeah, good for you. <laughs> well, of course, it was Sue who 
was also there to be interviewed and had been cooling her heels in the green room for some insane amount of time. Yeah. So I'm like, finally, like, who are you? Who are you? And then I'm like, how long? She's like, how long have I been here? How long have you been? And we go into the green room for like ever. <laughs> yes, and, for like ever. Yes. And compare notes about how did we get rooked into this and why is there no one here? Um, so during our incredibly long wait to find, get interviewed, <laughs> yes. we start talking. And she says, oh, don't you do a show? I know who you are. I even watch Little House of the Prairie. My kid watches Little House of the Prairie. But don't you have some sort of show? And I'm like, yeah, stand up the confession. She starts like staring at me and goes, is there video in this? I'm like, no, could there be? And starts asking me all these random questions about my show. This person who I've just met in a hallway. And then she says, you should come by the theater and we should talk about this. And like, you know, do a show. I go, okay. So I'm like, <laughs> I run, we make it a point. I rush down to the Renberg and I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be like some kind of audition process or something. We're going to talk maybe then. And I go down there and she gives me the tour of the theater. We have a whole conversation about the show and what could be done with the show and a great. And she goes, So yeah, how's the 25th? <laughs> Your pardon? <laughs> she's putting it in the calendar like, this is like two nights how do you want it made o'clock and i'm like i beg your pardon and she said no 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 we're, we're t- i mean like the artistic director here we're totally doing this thing and i was like oh all right and it was fantastic and so we wind up in this theater going through every single thing in my show every word phrase and she's like well what if it was this and then what if this happened and then maybe the thing and the thing and the best part of course like what if at the end nelly can you come out and there's something where like you are nelly and we went oh there was this long silence and finally she says do you have a wheelchair <laughs> <laughs> hence the infamous wheelchair sequence at the end of my show so it was brilliant and we we hit it off and that that is literally how we met and that's why confessions of a prairie bitch which then became confession d'une das in france complete with wheelchair um would not exist in its form without you you Uh, Well, you're very, very kind. And uh, here's what I want you to know. Working with you on that show, collaborating, literally going into that theater every single day for I don't know how long, Allison. It seemed forever. (laughs) It seemed forever. But we laughed so much. We laughed so much. I remember there was a day of rehearsal when we thought okay you know we're gonna we're really gonna knuckle down here we're gonna work for like three solid hours and i think this was the day that we really started talking about the ending and if you recall i don't think we got through five minutes of the show without just cracking up and finding it just so amazingly funny and it was and look i was a huge little house on the prairie fan uh i still am and being a part of that show was really just wow it it was amazing and funny and ridiculous right it was completely ridiculous what we were doing um but gosh people really absolutely adored that show now here's what i want to say about meeting you here's what i want to say about meeting you okay so i love your story that i sort of you know i was this person in the hall right that that's true as a person in the hall i was trying to cool my heels because i had been waiting for a few hours and you're right nobody was there except for the person in the uh in the studio and then she had a guest and you know what i will tell you i don't know if you know this part i actually barged in on their show (laughs) before you arrived because nobody was there. And I just kept wondering. She just people wandering in off wandering the street. around. Yes. And I was in the green room at one point. First, I made coffee, right? You First, made, you made I, coffee. I made you the made coffee. coffee. I made the coffee. Strangers off of spill. I remember making the coffee and going, well, I, I want some coffee. And uh, there, there's some ground. So I make the coffee. Uh, time goes on. Nobody's there. Like you say, I go into the studio and I literally see the, you know, the interviewer going, uh, we're, we're filming, you know, it was just like, w- w- what, what would you like? And I said, oh, I'm Sue Hamilton. I, I think my segment is next. I mean, it was just ridiculous. But here's the thing I remember about that. I remember adoring you right away. I remember absolutely loving you right away, uh, which is probably why I said something like, 
well, good for you, or that's nice, or whatever it was that came out of my mouth. But here's what I also remember. I also remember you and Bob talking about your car. Your car had broken down. And you were trying to, and I didn't know Bob yet. Right. And, but I remember talking to you about the show and then you going, hold, hold on one second. Okay, so where are you? Oh, honey, where are you? I mean, it was the most wonderful sort of talk about the show. We're both frustrated. We're not in the studio yet. And then Bob is somewhere with a broken down car. Do you remember this? Yeah, because, yeah. And that's the thing is he always, and he still always like works somewhere that's some insane drive. He's like driving back from LAX like right now Mm because he works down there. And at that time, oh my God, where in the heck was he working? So it was a schlep. So yes, it was like the car was broken down in God knows where. And I was going to go get, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Where are you? I remember leaving that day, you know, I had the old flip phone, right? I'm pretty sure I had a flip phone and I had put you in my phone okay. and, and I remember leaving and literally probably texting you 10 minutes later to say, uh, you know, when are you coming? I really want you to come on down to the Lily Tomlin, Jane Wagner cultural arts center. And I think, gosh, didn't we meet like the next day or, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, it was like, I think they're like, oh, are you free lunch the day after tomorrow? Or yeah. It was like immediately. Yeah. 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 Well, and then you booked it on, and then we're in the middle of workshopping this show, which is opening. It's got two nights on this day, which you picked. Like, I mean, you're doing it on this. Day. I am. I am. Okay. And we're doing the thing, and we're in the middle of workshopping this. And you're also directing last summer at Bluefish Cove in the other theater in the same complex at yes. the same time. Yes. And somebody got a gig, had to do something else. This is understood. And you just turn to me apropos of nothing in the parking lot. Do you want to do last summer at Bluefish Cove, like, you know, this weekend in the part of freedom? I said, beg your pardon. Because I, went, I said, you haven't even seen the thing. And you're like, well, yeah, but that's, it's a good part for you. I said, you're talking in a couple of days. And you said, sure. And I said, the play I have not seen. You said, right. I said, no, there's no way that could work. And you said, okay, we'll come see it. Well, yeah, I'll get someone this weekend, but just come see it. So I come see it. The next day, we're in there and you're like so you've seen it now yes so can you do it and I'm like, excuse me well we still need to come on for next week <laughs> what are you talking about and then you evil you did an evil thing because i said there's no fact i can't possibly film the show in next week it's still only a few days you quoted a line of dialogue from the show and i answered you you said something that someone said and Rita said, and I went, oh, ha, 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 and said it. And you went, see, you know the show. And I went, don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> that is evil. That was evil. And so I was in the show. And you said, look, we'll set up a special rehearsal because obviously, like, hello, you haven't even met the people. So you set up a special, everybody, came, they, it was fabulous. Everyone in the cast said, we'll be right over. And you set up an appointment and they came over and we had like a quickie special rehearsal. And then I did the damn thing. You did the damn thing. And yep. then how long did I do it? Because it got like extended. So then I was just like there forever. And it was a smash. And uh, it ca- I- Yes, it was a smash. I mean, I-, I love this. I love that you remind me of all this. This was a play that opened to run for six weeks. Mm-hmm. And it was extended uh, for eight or nine months. And I was there for a while because that was the thing. You were like, oh, it's only going to be for a little while. You only have to do it. And of course, I go into the place <laughs> and I'm like, how long are we doing this? And, um, but it was great. It was great. And, I, and, and the part of Rita was absolutely freaking dead on. And um, it was, it was, and, you were, yeah. you were, you were made to play that role and you were wonderful in it. That was a special time. You know, that was, remember all that sand? There was sand, sand which, everywhere. The was filled set. with sand. We're all running around our bare feet. And then there was some guy who kept coming to the show because he wanted to see women in their bare feet. And they oh, had to yes. Talk to I was like, yes. No, no, you can't be in the front row every night. Um, it was so strange. And so, yeah. So, and then I got to see how you directed someone playing a fictitious character as opposed to <laughs> their own thing. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And it was, the direction was so good. Like I said, the feeling of, having obviously worked with a lot of directors including like michael landon you want to be in a position where you you don't want to like come to the set and go the director doesn't what they're doing oh god we're all doomed you want to like the captain of the ship or a pilot feel like the director knows what they're doing that the thing's not going to crash 
and that if they say do this, it'll be a good idea. And so that level of trust that you can go, okay, and go along with, that's very, very important. And you do establish that right away with everything you do. Oh, well, thank you. That's very kind. And the fact that you put my name even near Michael Landon uh, brings me great, great joy. Yes. Now, you've dragged a lot of stuff. Okay, obviously, tons and oodles and poodles of theater and lots of gay theater and lots of cutting edge and creating insane things like my show. But then you started doing all this stuff for, well, Disney. And not just like ultimately Disney, but in Disneyland. Correct. Yes. In, uh, I did. And I think it was, uh, you know, 2007, eight, somewhere around there. I uh, joined the Disney family and I started directing more sort of traditional theater like Aladdin, a musical spectacular. Uh, I was the resident director there for many years. And yes, I did lots of things. I got to go to Hong Kong and Shanghai Disney Resort and direct uh, Frozen, you know, the Frozen show content. You directed and Frozen in another country. I did, yes, in but Asia. Did you, speak, you didn't speak the language. Did you speak the language? I do not. I have... And you were doing it in Chinese, <laughs> presumably. Yes. Uh, the first show was in uh, at Hong Kong Disneyland, and that was in Cantonese. And then the next show was at Shanghai Disney Resort, and that is in Mandarin Chinese. Right. And... Uh not even the same kind of Chinese. Hello, what get to do completely different languages? I know, I know. Well, I will say this. They they take care of me when I'm over there. They hold my hand and, uh, you know, don't let me go anywhere without a translator. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've had a really uh, lucky and uh, sort of generous career um, at Disney. And then I went on to ABC television where I got to do the ABC... Uh, television discovers talent showcase I did that for 14 years and uh, you know the last few years have been the executive producer there so yes Allison I've been very blessed uh, here's what I like to say I've gone from queers to mouse ears <laughs> and back again and back again and, and back again a wonderful world of web series I remember we did oh gosh well, two things really because it was the uh um the dream. Live, was it Live in the Dream? Oh, Live in the Dream, yes. Do you know every show I do, this is really weird, every production I do, web series, has either the word life or dream in the title. Hmm. I don't do it intentionally. Live in the Dream. I just finished, they did the movie that's been out, it's now out on Blu-ray, Even in Dreams. I did Life Interrupted, Living on a Prairie. And <laughs> I'm not making this up. Everything has life or dream in the title. Like, what kind of good karma thing is this? I do not know. Um, but so we were doing this thing, living the dream. And um, I was the mom. It was about a young man going into acting and trying to make it, but his overprotective parents. Didn't want, and I was, I was just the just overprotective, like overenthusiastic mom wants to come to the auditions. It's yes. Hysterical. So that was when met and Noel was there. But so many of the people in the production were people who'd been in Aladdin. It was all like, it was the, the strangest show. <laughs> and therefore, it was the strangest show. Uh, yes, well, Noel D. Orput, who was the, the uh, writer and my co-director and producer on that piece, had been in Aladdin. So Noel and I had been working together at Disney. And then John Schartzer, who played the lead, uh, my, my son yes your son was Aladdin he was Aladdin so yes we did have a nice collection mom for a week uh, technically I was Aladdin's mom it was yes well I love that I absolutely adore the scene Allison when he calls and he says and this takes place in the kitchen right interior kitchen and you're, you know, doing like opening we, ovens and things. doing ovens and opening yeah. drawers and, you know, cleaning silverware or something. And the phone rings and he says, I got an audition. And yeah, you say, I'm, going, I'm coming with you. Yes. Don't look at it. And then he tries to get it out of it. And I threatened to cut off his cell phone bill. So it's like, <laughs> It's our son. I love being at the other. It's our, he's our son. It's like someone was absolutely out of her mind. Um, so we did that. And then there was a marvelous thing, Tinder and Grinder. Yes. Tinder and Grinder, which took place in an interior car. In a, in, a, in a police car. It was it was two cops, one gays, one straight, one's Tinder, one's Grinder. It's very silly. And I was myself, basically. I was the 
fictional version of me, Alison Arngram comes right along with the, the Tinder and Grinder for research and yes. there's a box of donuts and very, very silly stuff. We did that. Very as well. silly. Yes. Yeah. So we've now worked together. Okay, yeah. So we've done we've done web series, we've done theater, we've done everything. Now, as a director who's written now a book about acting and directing, um, do you think there's a big difference? Every oh, actors always get I get that this all the time. What is the difference really between theater and film and television, or really is there one? Well, it's a good question. Yes, there's a difference in that I think there are subtleties that can be employed uh, when you're on camera, uh, perhaps a little bit more than when you're on stage, but of course not always, right? So uh, here's what I will say about acting, regardless of what the format or the medium is. If you're truthful, if you're authentic and you have a good director and you are collaborating and you are coming from a place of, um, honesty and truth, there's not much difference. I think when you, when you think, you know, when you start thinking about, well, what is this for, right? The cameras, you know, in my class, I, I have my students imagine that the camera is literally up their nose. Because it is so often. It's, it is so often. It's just right here, right? It's just right out of, right? It's right there. As an old person who had the big cameras, I'm so excited. Many older actors, oh, all this digital phenomenon. I love digital because the camera is much smaller and they can yes. even be further away and still be doing a close up. Whereas in my day, a camera the size of a small car had to be parked <laughs> right here with five guys like running it. So it's like, yes, this is a lovely intimate scene. What? Um, yeah. So it's much better now. It's much better now. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, like, like night and day, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, I, I think look, we see a lot of actors do a lot of different things. And I think that's awesome. Like you, right? Uh, you have gotten to do a variety of things. And that's what I say to my students, do a lot of things, go try things out, go, you know, go play, go get on the stage and play. If you've never done theater before, get on that stage and just play, right? So coming from this place of authenticity is, is really what is exciting to me. Yeah, I, for me, it is actually, it's like, you still have to be in a character. It's like theater. Well, it's louder. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to be louder and you can move around more. That, that's and, it. That's the difference. You just yeah, got to be louder. <laughs> it's pretty much the same. Well, I remember you said something when you were doing a lot of the Disney stuff and it was so crazy because you're directing you know, theater and television and all. And then you were like, and then I'm directing Aladdin and Frozen and Frozen in Chinese. And we're like staring at you. And did you work with like someone like even like the parade kind of people and stuff like to and we're like okay come on get serious the parade people like you're directing what the people dressed as Winnie the Pooh going down the street but you explain something about how like it's still the same thing the people in the parade have to transmit that they're happy to be there or like it's gonna be like a really bad parade yeah yeah well exactly I mean I think any any director who loves working with actors will take whatever actor is in front of them, right? Whether they've cast them or they've been cast for them and the director steps in and gets to work with actors. There is a, at least for myself, there is a collaboration and a commitment and a desire to make sure that whatever the story is that needs to be told, that that actor can do it, right? That that actor, and you take Disney as an example, that actor will probably be, do it, be doing it joyfully, right? It's Disney, right? Um, will probably be coming from a place of lots of energy. And, you know, if you think about parade performers or, you know, parade going down uh, Main Street USA in Anaheim, California, it's that sense of bringing joy. It's that sense of having fun, right? Um, you know, when I think of why did I name this book, Have Fun or Quit? It's been my motto for a really long time. I, I know you know that. My whole thought about HFOQ is the industry's hard, right? You know this. Hello. Hello. The industry is really hard. Film, TV, theater, it is hard 
And it is also wonderful. And so if you're going to be in it, have fun. Have fun being in it or quit. Go do something else. Exactly. Do something else. It's like what, I almost like any job. It's like, why? If you really hate it, there's got to be something else. It, and that's the thing is that I had never really, I can't think of, I love Disneyland. Spent a lot of time there. Disneyland Paris. Haven't been to Shanghai, Hong Kong. But love Disney shows and Disney parades. Hadn't thought about it until after you start doing it. I went, I got to start looking more closely when I'm like watching the Disney show. There's or, directors or, there? They there have obviously, directors? I'm like, duh, obviously they had to have directors, but how do they, and I watched the parade, I went, right, these people are marching through this park, it's going on for hours, and yeah. it's 102 degrees, and yeah. they're wearing all these really huge, enormous, heavy, and warm costumes, and by God, they're going down the street going, <laughs> and everyone, and they don't stop and that smile does not go away and their eyes and they're not like you could you could after like how many parades be like like dead eyes you know yeah. you could be like and i want they're not they're all doing something yeah. however small cinderella's hanging out of the coach they're doing something they are actually creating a character and in the moment i'm going oh right what? this is amazing everyone the parade is and when you see the show you go well of course as a director you can't you can't have the show go at disney where people can have it like suck obviously <laughs> one has to make it happen but i started watching them all more closely and just going okay right what, what do you have to think about when you're in the parade and you think so yeah absolutely like it's but it is about are you happy? Are you in the character? Are you exuding? Are you happy to be there? The shows that work, stage shows and TV shows, the people are there. They either either are happy and like it, or even if they're like miserable, they're they're assigned to the same goal and they're going, I'm gonna make the show if it's the last thing I do. They're happy about that. Right. We had a really good time making Little House on the Prairie. It mm. shows. It shows massively. Mm. And that's the thing so and then when you know we and i left in the seven year because i was like i don't play this anymore Bye. <laughs> i knew it then and it does show and so if you're yeah. just you can't really be completely miserable and then play a character even yeah. playing a miserable character it won't work well i remember i remember a story that you told which which i will share um but i'm, I'm also just thinking about the relationship that actors have with their audience right? So you take a piece of live theater or you take a parade, right? The relationship that those actors then have with the live audience needs to be fresh every single time, right? So like you stepping on stage with Confessions of a Prairie Bitch, you can't say, oh, well, these people probably saw it last night, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna phone it in tonight. Um, that would not work, right? That would not work for you and it would not work for the audience. So I remember the story you told in rehearsal about um, being on set on the Little House on the Prairie set and that Michael Landon was sort of famous for bringing, bringing in families and, and, and on-set guests who could sort of walk around and you know, watch you film and have this amazing experience, right? And I remember you said that one day he, and you can correct my storytelling if it's not totally accurate, but he said something like you see those people over there and you were like yeah and he said you work for them yeah and that was so powerful that's so powerful Absolutely. to think about that yeah he said you it's not, you're not this isn't for me you're not doing this for me you're not doing this for nbc it's them yeah. they, they stopped watching this whole thing's over that's who we work for and yeah. it was like to hear that as a teenager and have that yeah. i know well that oh my gosh what an amazing lesson right but as you said phoning it okay i've been doing shows here in the living room i got the backdrop over here <laughs> where the pandemic hit that my show i was supposed to do a show in new york that that may may of 2020 like everything's canceled so next thing you know we go on this thing stage it.com and i get this call you want to do it on stage it sure how do i do it i don't know and then i had to call someone who'd done it and then so I have been doing like once a month a, a mini stand up show here in the living, like right over there with the little backdrop. And it's a shamrock. We just did the St. Patrick's Day show. We have a Valentine's book for Christmas one and Halloween. Sure. And I do some of the material. We do a big QA section. People put their questions on Facebook and I read the questions just like if it's in the show. And I have a wheelchair parked in the kitchen that we roll from the kitchen as the dressing room onto the stage. And it was very difficult at first. I'm starting to get like kind of good at it, that 
there's no audience. It's like the old gigs in the 70s where it's like, well, we're going to go on Don Kirshner's rock concert or one of these TV shows, and they had, like, no studio audience. And you just had to stand there and do your stand-up and put it in later. It was brutal, but you did it. And it's like that. I'm shouting at the back of a computer. And Bob's there, Bob, luckily, who laughs in all the right places. Thank God. Yeah. Um, and he'll do a thumbs up. He'll see the comments and go, they like that one. And But literally, I am alone with Bob and the cats in the living room going, and then there was the time at the back, I'm hoping that someone is getting this. And that is like an insane acting exercise of how do you do that? How yeah. do you do the relationship with the audience and make that fresh? With, did you, did you, nobody there. Yes, that's when you just make up that the, you can really hear those voices, right? You can really hear those voices. Voices are in my head. <laughs> yeah. So I'm reading your book and, and so much good stuff. Um, you have me saying things on that. I remember things that you said, you know, you, you were saying have fun or quit way back. Yeah, you also had a thing that you did. You said you learned it in cheerleading like a thousand years ago that if something wasn't going well, something went wrong, or we're all having trouble to seeing, you go, okay. These are the breaks. <laughs> I'm like, what is she doing? What is she doing? You go, take it these down. These are the breaks. These are the breaks. the breaks. Take it down, take it down, take it down, take it down. Yes. Oh my gosh. You remember these are the breaks. I remember everything. And the first time you did that, I went, oh my God, she's gone mad. What is she doing? And I was like, what does that mean? And then you said, hey, there was this cheerleading thing. I mean, sometimes like, yay, they're winning. And then if they weren't, this is what we did. And I thought, a cheer for when your team is losing or fumbled the ball. Or That's a thing? And then genius, of course you would need that. And then it made sense. So then for the actors, if you're feeling, oh, yeah, you know how actors are? Oh, I went, I did something wrong. It didn't work. I'm going to kill myself. And everything's like the end of the world every right. time. And she said, these are the breaks. I went, what an interesting idea. Have you been chanting that all these years, Alison? God, yes. Been God, yes. <laughs> yes. These are the breaks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, backstage in France, I'm going, okay, these are. <laughs> How do you say that in French? Ah, uh, I don't. Why would be the equivalent of these are the breaks? I'm not sure. We need to find out. We, we need will to have find to come out. up with this. We oui, see, c'est, c'est la, c'est la, c'est la, c'est la, no break. I have to come up with an equivalent word for breaks. These yeah. are the, c'est la, the yeah, oui. you got to do that. You got to do that. Prom, 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 prom. <laughs> Uh, Pron on bar, take it down. Um, you talk about perfectionism. You talk about all the traps people get into. Um, you uh, and you have another saying. You have Sheila. <laughs> yes, I have Sheila, and um, I would love to read a little bit about Sheila, Please, if I may. I love okay, Sheila. I have a big Sheila. That's yes, me. I'm oh my gosh, let's talk about Sheila. So this is uh, from day three. And it's called fear. Dear students, I'm thinking about fear. Fear can stop us in our tracks and prevent us from fully showing up. Fear can even get in the way of starting. Fear for an artist can be so debilitating that a dream gets relegated to a shelf where it can sit dusty and ignored for days, months, or even years. In one of my ongoing classes in a discussion about fear, we turned our attention to the voice inside that tries to convince us we'll never get what we truly want as artists. Acting student Shay shared the name she has for that voice. She calls it Sheila. No disrespect to actual people named Sheila. Sheila is a pessimistic fear monger who sits on our shoulders and whispers ever so quietly, you're never going to make it, so stop trying. Or you'll never be the successful actor you want to be, so don't even start. Or it's already too late. You're past your prime. Your ship has sailed. Better to stay in the harbor where you won't break a hip. Sheila can show up at any time, and she wants us to fail. When Shay first shared this name with the class, we all laughed. But looking more closely, I decided that Sheila is the perfect acronym for all she embodies. She hates every idea leading to action. Sheila is fear, plain and simple. Can we get rid of Sheila? Do we want to get rid of Sheila? How about if we kill her? 
in one of our classes, we actually did kill her. And then a few months later in another class, Sheila showed up again. Wait a minute, didn't we kill you? Apparently not. Sheila is immortal, as it turns out, but she doesn't have to be omnipotent. So rather than using our energy toward eliminating her altogether, we might do better to find an appropriate place for her. Sheila, with all her disgusting and annoying ways, can invite curiosity. What if Sheila sincerely believes she's trying to help, but just doesn't know how? She may mean well, but the manner in which she communicates is messy, confusing, rude, and wholly annoying. Come on, we all have at least one relative like this. What if we're so bothered by what she says because we know we're bravely inching out of our comfort zones in the direction of our dreams? In other words, what if Sheila is actually revealing our deepest, most desired aspirations, the things we want most, at which we are the most afraid to fail? Sheila communicates under the guise of trying to protect us from feelings like rejection or embarrassment. Can we instead invite her voice to fuel us as we bravely and vulnerably commit to moving forward? Sheila can be a reminder that we're on the right path, not the safe one, continuing to take good risks and betting on ourselves every time. The next time Sheila shows up, thank her for coming along for the ride and let her know that she can stay, but with boundaries. She is not allowed to sit in the pilot seat. You are the pilot. She can sit in the last row of the plane with her head up against the outer wall of the tiny bathroom. She can even sit near the window if she likes, free to scowl out at the changing weather. She's allowed to bark warnings from her seat, but she must remain seated at all times. You may listen to her from the cockpit, but remind her that at no time is she permitted to take the controls. The door to the cockpit is locked anyway. As an artist, you owe it to yourself to keep curiosity as part of your daily practice. Turn Sheila's whisperings or yellings into curiosities. Let's see where that takes us. HFOQ. <laughs> In for the each book, yes, is a letter. It is a letter. It goes it's a letter. Sheila, it's a. I love Sheila because yeah, that's every actor's the, the nightmare is the voice. And I think of Sheila when I was reading it, is, is is sort of like an overprotective mother or grandmother, or something, but like an insanely overprotective parent. It's like oh no, you know, what will people think and and they'll make yeah. a mistake. Yeah, and that's a biggie for actors because now here's one. Hello, child stars. Er, er. Um, so as an actor, if you're new and you're a young person in, say, your late teens, early 20s, an adult, and you're not famous, you have a lot of freedom and leeway. And so if you're in a play or a movie that maybe isn't good, who cares? You, you're not a big star yet. You're going to do whatever. You can make mistakes. You can fall down. You can get up. If you're a big star and you have a brand and what have you, you, you have managers and agents and publicists, people saying, well, you got to be careful. You can't just do any movie. You, you know, you can do this. You can do some, okay, you can go do some summer stock or some crazy place somewhere, but you can't, you know, just do anything because you're, you're so-and-so now. But imagine if you're at that level of fame at 12 mm. or God forbid the people do the eight <laughs> and you're famous and you're now a kid. You haven't even hit 18. You haven't even gone to college, high school yet. Mm. And you have a team of people, professionals, saying you can't just be in anything. And you're a kid. You've barely started. But as an actor, you're being told you cannot make a mistake. You cannot fall on your face. You cannot take risks mm. with your performance or be in something crazy. And that's an enormous burden to put on someone. Mm. And so things that are very stunning and they're done in the name of being protective. And so I think a lot of people, if they started very young, especially hello, me and all my child friends, have to really run up against that one every day. The voice saying, oh no, 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 because you know, you're blah, blah, blah. And you have the, and you can't, you can't do all these things. Mm. Well, that is powerful. Uh, and wow, what a heavy, I mean, that's, that's, that's a load, Allison. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that is a load and I know that you had to endure that and you know I would be curious to well maybe this isn't the show for it or maybe it is but I would love to know how do you overcome that how do you 
how do you work through that? I mean, you were so young. And like you say, you had a team and you had a brand and you had do this, don't do that. No, no, not this, not that. Whoa, 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 don't go over there. Not those people, right? How do you, how do you navigate through that at that age? Very difficult. And, and it was, and so then, and then as adult, I think that's what confessions of a prairie bitch, but the show in the book, that was a lot of that was about because in the show it's saying, yes, I was this and, and then deconstructing the thing and saying all the things about myself and about Nellie Olson, about Little Elsa Mary, the, well, you don't say that. And I, I've told people who are doing one person shows or stand up or writing a book, I say, you know, the story that everyone, your friends and your agents and managers tell you, oh, for God's sakes, don't tell anybody that story. Start uh, with that one. That's chapter one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <That's the opener>. <laughs> 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 like embarrassing thing you can think of. Like start there. Um, and that was the thing is so many of the crazy stories were embarrassing, insane incidents. We're like, you know, should we tell people about that one? It's like, yes, yes, yes. I'm going to tell everyone about that one. Yes. And that was enormously freeing. That was, that was huge. And of course, then what happened? Was it a terrible disaster? No, it was like the best thing that ever happened and like massively improved my entire life and career. And that then right there said, well, that clearly that tells me that <laughs> you don't have to stick to the plan right and you don't have to listen to sheila anymore and you don't have to listen to sheila or you know or you can tell sheila sheila i know you're trying to protect me that's very nice of you could you like sit over there and like have some cookies or something because yeah. it's that <laughs> it is yeah. and to do crazy stuff and not be afraid to fall on your face and it's the only way anything well that's happen it at all. That's right. It's the only way that things are going to happen. And, you know, you, you talk to an actor who's, you know, reached a certain level of success like you, right? L reached a certain level of fame or what have you. And, and this, you know, what we always hear is, I just had to do it. I just had to get out of my head. I had to stop worrying about what people would think or, you know, how they might, you know, think about my appearance or the sound of my voice or is my makeup correct or what about my hair and I should have my lips done and you know and it just goes on and on and on and on and on and it becomes not just an obsession but it, it becomes this commitment to perfectionism mm -hmm. which will literally stop us in our tracks right um if you and I came on here today and all we were doing was thinking about being perfect and talking to each other and for whoever's watching and listening we wouldn't show up no, no, my right. show, this show wouldn't happen ever. Wouldn't it happen. Would you wouldn't have started it. Yeah, you wouldn't have started it. Well, I will tell you when I started writing this book, as you can imagine, you know, with any book, it's like I started writing it years ago. I'd look at it and go, I, I hate this book. And I'd throw it, I literally throw it away. Right. And I, and I, you know, I'd start it again and then I'd get like four or five months down the road and I'd go, mm, no, I don't, I don't like that either. And I literally tear it up or throw it in the can. But something unique happened at the top of the pandemic. I started writing my students more daily updates. And that was because we were not gathering in, in person. We were gathering on Zoom, excuse me, on Zoom, which was great, but I wasn't hugging the people, right? Hello. So yeah, so I started writing more to them. And then I went, oh, oh, that's the format right? That's the format of the book. And then as soon as I realized that's how I needed, wanted to do it, that motivated me to get up in the morning and actually do it. Then it just kind of flowed out of me. But here's what I will say. The first thing I wrote when I started writing this book was this will not be a perfect book. In fact, this might just be a shitty book <laughs> and you should write it anyway. And so that's what I did. I wrote a not perfect potentially shitty book, which I don't think is too shitty, but I had to, I had to make that deal with myself that it was okay if it wasn't the best thing in, uh, on the planet. Right. And, and I think we all have to do that we, as actors, we have to step on the mark and go, you know what, this might not be the best take, but I still got to do the take. Yeah. Right. Picture still Wait. up. I got to go right? I got things need to come out of my mouth or I'm doing a reaction shot or I need to do the blocking or whatever it is. It's, I got to show up on my mark and I need to commit to doing it, whether it's perfect or not. 
and it's interesting because it's done in these little like daily things like here's today's topic and then one of them you talk about doing that very thing journaling and telling the students to journal and write little things and you a brief time too you don't say like sit down for hours with your book when you tell them only so many days a week and for only so many minutes yeah well i think that's a great way to get started because here's what i know about journaling people have a love-hate relationship with journaling right so most of the time when i say okay friends you know i'm gonna invite you to start journaling most of the time it's like uh oh she's gonna read it <laughs> oh no i need to be perfect in the writing and so then i unpack it and say no no i'm never gonna look at it it's not for me in fact i don't even want you to read it right just start with these very small 11 minutes a day four days a week it's 11 like minutes a day it's like nothing it's you know pour yourself your coffee or your tea in the morning whatever your you know ritual sacred space in the morning that you do integrate some writing literally get an old school pen and an old school paper and start scrawling some thoughts down oh, no. <laughs> yeah set your timer Here's what that does. It unlocks things. It allows us to see our patterns and it doesn't have to be deep seated. Oh my gosh, I'm having this discovery. It could be something simple like, I'm realizing that I'm always late. I'm realizing that I'm always rushed. I'm realizing that I'm writing the same thing every day. Like, why am I not getting auditions or why does my manager return my call? It just allows us to start to see from a self-reflective -reflect place what's going on, right? What's going on? And, the, and it's not to be judged. It's just, it, it allows us to be self-reflective. And that is something I think that actors are naturally good at, but can also be better at. And it takes the pressure off. It's oh, it's eleven minutes. It's four days a week. It's eleven. It's not even half an hour. It's eleven minutes. What could go yeah. wrong in eleven minutes? <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> it takes the pressure off. Now I have to ask because, as I said, we're zooming and talking about your class, you in person, and then pandemic, and we went to Zoom, and then back in person, back in. So auditioning. There's a lot of talk about auditions, the process when in, in the before times we got in our car and we drove across town and you could sit in your car and prepare, and then you could go in and you meet the casting agent. Nah, it, it, everything is massively on tape, either at a place where they tape you or in your living room where you video yourself and you send it in. And yeah, they, people can meet in person now, but for the casting directors who figured out they didn't have to pay people to sit in a room and see actors or pay people to run camera, they're like, well, I'm gonna go back to that. We get everybody just tape in the living room. We'll save like billions of dollars. We have to hire all these people to hold auditions. So now we're in this world where for the time being, till they get bored with it, the majority of auditions are going to be you set up your phone and your camera in your living room and you do the audition. You don't talk to anybody unless you're lucky and they want to have a Zoom call with you. Yeah. Um, how do we put take all of these things that we're learning and reading in this book about the audition method and do it when they're, they're, there's nobody there? Yeah. Yeah, it's such a good question. And it goes back to what you were talking about, right? You were doing stand up in your own living room, right? You're setting up the backdrop, you know, Bob's looking at your lighting, he's going like this when he's seeing, you know, uh, responses. I, I think we are adapting. I think we're getting better at watching ourselves, which is good. And then comes with some challenges, right? Because now what we're doing is we're doing a lot of self tapes at home. And then we're going like this. So, oh, I don't like that. I'm going to do it again. Okay, let's do it again. And then, oh, I don't like that one either. I'm going to do it. Oh, I don't like that one either. Oh, God, I don't like that one. Right. So we're getting into this, this pattern. So here's what I will say to actors who are listening. Be kind to yourselves in this process. Be gentle with yourselves as you look at your material. Don't nitpick how your mouth is moving. Don't nitpick those little things that make you, you, right? Do the job, stand on your mark, get everything set and do it a few times and then let it go, right? Because I think now we're getting, again, we're watching ourselves a lot. So we're getting more and more uh, addicted to wanting it to be perfect. And, well, and 
am I going to get beat up for the audition because someone has a better camera or they have a it's, better color color exactly backdrop? exactly and that's the thing it can't be about the technical right and and of course if you can afford it yes get some nice lighting if you can afford it get a nice backdrop get something clean blue or gray make it very simple if you can afford it you know make sure that you've got a nice microphone but if you're in this very sort of beginning stage or it's not financially prudent for you to be spending a bunch of money, you don't have to, right? Casting directors are not looking for perfection. They are looking for, is Allison the right one for this role, right? How does Allison fit into this picture or not? I uh, got to speak to a group of MS, MFA students and BFA students last week at Cal State LA. Uh, my friend Randy Trabitz, who uh, is one of the professors there, invited me to come and speak on a panel. And fortunately, I was on a panel with one actor and two casting directors. And the greatest thing these casting directors were saying to this, you know, young group of students who are just starting out is, you don't need the fancy stuff. Just do, do it, right? It, it, when we say we want a, a full body slate, we don't care if the sofa's in the slate. You know, we don't really care if we can see, you know, that there's a stain on the floor. We just want to see you. But we get, as artists, we get so addicted to, well, I know what's good, right? I, I know how I want to appear. And I know I can be better than that. That last take wasn't me. I got to, I, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. And now you've, you know, you've spent four hours doing five lines not a healthy way to spend the afternoon and you freak yourself out you freak yourself out so bad probably the right. last take is terrible <laughs> exactly it's either terrible <laughs> <You're> crazy <laughs> exactly it's either terrible or it's exactly like the first one yeah right right, right? Yeah, that's, i've had that where i've had several and then looked at it and went <laughs> like the first one <laughs> yeah <laughs> like the first, first one it's like oh my god so all right shockingly we are running out of time um your website where people can get a book where people can come take class and people can find you yes it's suehamiltonstudio.com you can find the book on amazon i uh, would be delighted if somebody wants to go uh check out the book it's um you know getting a lot of great feedback from actors and it's others long. it's not long it's, it's not it's a quick it's read and, I, and the little chapters, little chapters, little chapters. Know. Yes, I, I, I deliberately uh, kept it brief so you can throw it in your backpack. You can put it underneath the seat of your car right before you go into an audition, because some auditions are still in person or coming back in person. And you can literally flip it open and go, oh, yeah, I got this. I, I got this. This is an audition. I know how to do this. So it should feel like a, a portable pep talk nice nice and remember if you you don't get the part these are the breaks these are the breaks <laughs> oh i miss seeing you i need to see you yes we must get together we must get together everybody at so sue hamilton studio dot com dot com sue hamilton like it says on their thing there sue hamilton studio dot com and so there you go go there you can find the book you can find the classes you can read all about her amazing amazing person fascinating story and very very handy stuff to know um so thank you so much for coming on my show thank you thank you allison for having me what a joy what a joy and this is the allison arngram show and i'm allison arngram Love from my